some man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am.
not on my own, but on the sun. He came to me in peace and held me in his arms and said to me, I found true love and said to me, I found When I receive his son in me, down at his feet is not where I am found to be, but on the sea, right by his side, but on the sea, right by his side.
what you're going to do tonight in Jesus name amen choir thank you how was your week huh tell me how was your week it was good okay mine was good as well and we have a greater week to come praise the Lord this week is going to be better than the last week do you believe it glory to God before we start I want to welcome those that are online streaming centers you are welcome and quickly father I thank you for the most generous people in the world I could never ask for any other I pray for their giving amaze supply all their needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus and all saints said Amen. allow me to go straight into the word because of time now today is one of those days I want to make good because in one of those sermons I promised to teach something uh, today or one day which is today and uh, I realized that many people were not taught or do not carry revelation of how to deal with the power of expectation and drawing from that power of expectation to receive all God has promised through Christ Jesus. And I shared in the first service and I said, partly because there are many things today that have misrepresented God in doctrine, in character, in nature. That is why when you give your heart to God, the Bible tells us he will teach you to observe his ways. It's important to separate what men think about God from what God is, who he is, and how he performs. There are many people today who are relating with idols in the name of worshiping God. One of that in the indelible commands given to us in scripture is never to build an idol or a molted image in the name of God. And sometimes even in our generation, we are guilty without knowing it. But sometimes it's the forms of godliness that are built in our traditions. Sometimes it's the things that the world has revealed about Jesus. And those things have come into our spirit we have accepted and received them as gospel truth. I wish I get time one day to speak. Uh, this is something that I would rather speak to ministers or in the master class because it is hard to have such conversations with people who have not worked with God for so long. You know, the Bible says you must carry wisdom to know what to give and when to give it. You know, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So sometimes as a minister, you're torn between sharing so much to prove how much you know versus to love enough to know what is edifying to the people you're ministering to. In the same spirit of wisdom, Paul says, I became all things to all men as of them which are under the law as one which is under the law and, of, and then to them which are not under the law as of them which are not under the law, but not under the law of Christ. He says, I became all things to all men that I might save some. So sometimes we can become all things. We can find ourselves agreeable with where we are able to be understood. Not because we belong there, but because we might lose certain people in trying to explain certain things. For example, the Lord has uh, been speaking to me so for a long time about idolatry, how we build idols. I'll give you a typical example. If you ask a Christian and ask them, what's the, what's the definitive vision that you carry about Jesus? What's that definitive vision? If I said, define Jesus, what would you say? You would go back to that movie when you were younger. They probably used a white fellow, long hair, nice beard, trimmed, 
When they strip him, I remember he has muscles. If you watch the Passion of the Christ, you might even fall in love with a man before you even understand his message. Because the guy was good looking. And so, so some people wait in vision to see Jesus looking exactly like that. And some of you, that's the picture you have about Jesus. But if we are to have a conversation on the vision of Christ, you'll find that many people have assumed to have visions of Jesus which are simply familiar spirits. Some people have claimed to have visions of God, but yet they are familiar spirits. Remember the way of the spirit. Satan says before the fall that he wants to be like the most high God, Isaiah 14, 14. So that means the way of Satan is to copy, make counterfeit versions of everything God has made or created. And so with everything you call true or right, Satan has created a copy because he has always lived in the shadow of trying to be like God. You should never forget that. The Bible says, no marvel, Satan is transformed as an angel of light. So how many people have received an angel of light in vision and they said, God appeared to me? You understand it? Because they think all light is divine. But it takes a certain place of maturity to understand what light is. And you can only understand it through the optics of truth. Only truth can define light. Paul tells us that the highest level of darkness is actually revealed in the way of some sort of light. Satan has transformed himself that way. Paul says that if the light that is in thee be darkness, oh, what great darkness. That means that the deepest revelation of the devil is hidden or imbued in some sort of light. So if you carry no revelation of truth, your assumption of light will differ depending on where your eyes see and how they see, depending on the vision of God. And that is why when we talk about consecration, okay, one of the things God consecrates the believer, most important things is the consecration of your vision. You remember when Paul is on his way to Damascus, he was persecuting the church. He was persecuting believers. And a bright light comes, brighter than the sun. Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute us? Me, why do you persecute me? But in the nature of light that appears to him, he realizes this was not an ordinary spirit. It must have been God. But he realized that in the light he had been functioning for all his life in the revelation of God according to Judistic teaching, this light before him was quite different from the light through which he saw God, from the lenses through which he related and served God. Remember, in persecuting the church, he thought he was actually serving God because he was trying to kill people who were assuming the Messiah had come, yet he had not come. Judaism didn't believe that the Messiah came in the flesh. Otherwise, he would have rebuilt the temple, quote and unquote, as though to assume that he came to build temples of brick and stone. Yet Paul is telling them the God we're talking about does not dwell in temples built by human hands. Maybe the mystery was that he had come to rebuild this temple, break it down, and in three days I'll rebuild it. He was not talking about a physical building. Jesus never left one physical building on earth that that was a building built by Jesus. Paul never left a building. Peter ne never left a building. Mark never left a building. Luke didn't. We are the ones who build those forms, the church of Jesus Christ at. <laughs> you know? But God 
his vision is not brick and cement. It is individuals. What did they leave? They left a what? A message. And that message has built us cathedrals. And it will continue to build us cathedrals. But he's not in these buildings. He's inside us. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So back to what I was trying to tell us here. Many times when we talk about Jesus Christ, the vision we have is important. That is why for Paul, so God had to blind him. Why would he blind him? Because he needs to give him the true vision of who he is. But he cannot have a true vision of who he is by, before first blinding him from the vision of what he thought he had about God. Are you following? And that is why he's in Damascus and then he runs blind. And then the Bible says, and Aeneas comes to him, speaks into his life. And then the Bible says his eyes were what? Scales fell off. Scales fell off. From that day, he began a life of a true vision of God. Otherwise, in the light in which he assumed to know God, he actually fought against God. He kicked against the pricks. So it's important, the primary consecration of your life when you become born again is the consecration of your vision toward God. So you, you dream about this guy. And it's exactly what you saw in that 1992 movie, translated in your local language. <laughs> then you say, oh, I saw Jesus last night. Maybe. Maybe not. So I took time in studying idolatry, and I, I started to study how did Jesus look like. And scripture was clear how Jesus looks like. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he shall grow up as a tender, what? Plant and as a root out of a dry ground. The Bible says he has no form of no comeliness. He has no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, the Bible says there is no beauty that we should desire him. So when Isaiah had the true vision of Jesus, he realized that actually many people would miss him because there was nothing attractive about him. So that guy in the person of a Christ who looks like God used the pawn tractor and the ruler to design his nose, maybe is not the picture of Jesus. The message version says <laughs> that there was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause a second look. Ladies, you know what I mean? <laughs> huh? Like a guy passes and you're like, yeah, that's a second look. Oh, gentlemen, some of you, when some women pass, you... That's, that's what they call it, what? A second look. That if you were in Jerusalem that day, and you were taking a cup of tea on the streets of Nazareth, and Jesus passed, you just take, whoo, and you see him, and you go back to your tea, like... Because it has always been the nature of God to appear in the familiar. He always loves drawing visions in what is familiar. And unfortunately, with that familiarity comes the simplicity of Christ. And now Paul says he worries that we will be deceived like the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety of his mind that you should be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. Because Christ appears in the most simple things. He tells Paul, you shall be a minister and witness of those things I, will re I have sh showed thee and in the things in which I shall appear to you. In other words, I don't need to come in that picture of the guy you saw in the movie. I can actually appear to you in many ways. In the Old Testament, I came as a rock. But how many people know that that thing which Moses was beating was actually Jesus? How many people knew that it was the pillar? How many people knew when Melchizedek was on the earth that he was actually the very spirit of Christ? And that's the same priesthood. Do you know how many people miss angelics? They just miss them. Because God can bring a person who looks exactly like you. Or less. 
And you might never know that that's your salvation is somewhere. That's why he says, when, when strangers come, eh, welcome them. Because among them, you have entertained angels and you have not known. And some of us realize that a bit later. You see what I'm saying? It just happens like that. So, I think in our generation, if we have to give a conversation of idolatry, it's the things tradition and sometimes religion has defined about this God and then we seek to relate with him from the picture of the idol the world has given us. And many of us, the Bible says we err because we don't know the scripture nor his power. We carry a form of godliness but do not carry the power thereof because we have a wrong vision of who he is. That's why whenever you pray, ask for the true vision. Because familiar spirits are working everywhere. I uh, watched a documentary of a lady who became born again. She was a devil worshiper. And the spirit that came on her when she was a child was a spirit that had functioned for about 900 years in memory. She had a memory of 900 years in the kingdom of the devil. Some of you have heard of the story. And, and, and so she could tell you. She could tell you because she was a devil worshiper chosen since she was little. Now this lady says, of course, astral projection, out of body experiences, they used to move in the spirit freely. They used to create images of vision on the eyes of men. And then she confesses in church after salvation and says, actually, in many times, we used to create visions on two people and commissioned men in two callings and mandates God had not called them because it was one way of weakening the church. She said, it's easy. We just needed to appear like some sort of angel, like some sort of picture that was easy for the person to relate with us. But that day in us, the second most growing religion in the world, which is Islam, has its leader who claims that he was in a cave and an angel, Gabriel, appeared to him and then he gave him the oracle. Muhammad, you see what I'm saying? So if Muhammad, by vision, quote and unquote, has a book that does not agree with your book or does or has taught things that are not agreeable, but he also claims a stand on vision. Paul says that they have a wrong stand of vision. They claim to see things they have not seen. And he says, let no one defraud you. It's in Colossians. By acting as an umpire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you from the prize. Because during that time, there were men which had come in unawares, crept into the church and started to impose doctrines that were contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And they insist on self-abasement, the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions. In, co in courts, he claims he has seen. They have a wrong stand on visions. And they are vainly puffed up by sensuous notions, inflated by unspiritual thoughts and fleshly conceit. conceit. So we, we, somebody can say, oh no, the Lord showed me. And I've seen, I've seen people destroyed literally, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say it as hard as it is, by prophets. I know marriages that are no more because of some prophets. I know ministries that are no more because of some prophets. I know destinies that are switched because of some prophets. Am I against the prophetic? No, I'm not. I prophesy. But we also must understand, because you see, and I, I always warn you, that the, whatever God has to do in ministry and gifting, it must come with the vindication of the Spirit. And the vindication of that spirit is the affirmation in you that justifies the presence that that word should come with. Some of you have noticed that sometimes we're in instances where certain people are flowing in a spirit, but you cannot connect with the presence of God because it, some spirits are not of God. And I'm not here to now teach which one is of God and which one isn't. No, my work is actually to tell you which one is of God. And then you take your difference. You see, my work is not to point fingers. But what I'm trying to tell us here, that you see, again, there are idols and visions that we have defined, images in our spirits about God that are actually not true. And partly people are struggling and suffering in the world because of that. There's a church in my neighborhood. 
This morning as I was preparing to come, this is intercessor who had a microphone and she was praying. But the way she was praying was conflicting and contradictory to the God of the Bible. How long will you punish us? Oh, forgive us. What have we done to you? Enough is enough. Can't you have mercy? Jesus. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this woman is talking about another God. She didn't understand the Lord of mercy and grace. But who taught her that God is just there to punish you? Who told her that God just has this hammer in heaven waiting for you to just make that one mistake and then he'll mess you up. <laughs> are, you, are you following what I'm saying? Because we have a wrong vision of God. It was taught us. So sometimes when we are approaching the Father, we go like this. But he says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you come timid, the father doesn't know how to deal with you. So she commissioned men, this devil worshipping woman, and she could identify the churches of men who started church not on divine commission. Because it's one way to weaken the church. You just mix, you sow tears among the what? The wheat. You know the Bible says when they were asleep, the enemy came in and the farmer had sown his, his, his wheat during day. But when men slept at night, the farmer came, the, the devil comes in at night and then he sows tares among the wheat. Doesn't it shock you that today some people point at certain ministries that you, you know in your heart are true and they say those ones are false. And then you say, eh, am I the one who says badly? No, it's their vision of God. It's their vision of God. It's their vision of God. It's not new. When Paul was persecuting the church, he knew he was serving God. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So, familiar spirits, and some of you, they come in your dreams as uncles, as aunties. You know, my dead father came. Eh? And now some of our African cultures, some of you who come from some families which, you know, used to have shrines and whatever. You even had that chosen vessel through whom when Jaja who dies wants to communicate, they say, aha, over what is Jaja saying? And then they burn a few things and put them on the nose of the person. And these guys speak, and they were accurate. They're very accurate. Can say, oh, when I died, I hid some money in the ceiling of the third bedroom where Richard sleeps. And then you go in the ceiling and find the money there. Then they have a family prophetess. <laughs> I've dealt with some. Is one I was helping some time ago. And the demon was speaking through her. How it has instructed the family for years. Are you following what I'm saying? And I always tell Christians, when you get to a point of wanting to help such people, the first thing you must do is separate them from that, from, from the, the, the being a medium. Because you see, whenever such familiar spirits come, they usually want to use this individual as a medium. Okay? They are using them as a platform to speak. Remember, you cast out a devil, it goes in the dry places, comes back, finds the house, one, empty, swept and garnished. But the word there is empty. What does it lack? It lacks truth. It lacks the word. So you have believers who are just in churches of deliverance only. You, this is security. will leave you. Fire, go. Eh, eh, eh. I'm free. Yeah? And then they say, I'm free. No, no. You're not free because they cast out that devil. You are free because it cannot come back. Do you understand? So some people go to churches, they teach them every spirit, Kazinda, Naguni, Namakura, some are names, you understand, of people, Mukasa. So you know every kind of demon, you, you, you are even insecure every time you're walking. This is Dungu. Are you following? So familiar spirit, so you, you cannot deliver such people until you first silence, learn. If you want them free, first silence the demon. Because remember, they, they cannot function if they're not talking. 
Demons were not created to speak in the air. I know that those are movies. Those are Nigerian movies. <laughs> Every demon spirit looks for a body. Do you understand? You remember when Jesus finds demons and, and, and then he wants to cast them out of a man? They say, at least send us in there. Peaks. They wanted where life was, where water was. They, they wanted to connect to something. They, they, they are restless when they are not in the body. They prefer. They cannot speak in the, in the, in the, in the dry land. They need something to speak. So if you want to help that person, firstly, one of the things you must learn is to silence them. You understand? You silence them and make sure that they are not using this person as a medium, then you can get to the next level of dealing with that demon spirit. Because if it is hushed, then the rest is just simple. But if you want to struggle for hours, <laughs> chase them when you're not silencing them, you'll see. They can even abuse you. They can even say something that can shame you, and it's not true. You understand what I'm saying? I, I will not go there. I remember the story. <laughs> But if I say to you, <laughs> you laugh for so long, I'll not preach. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So familiarity, well, God, because he appears in the familiar, Satan has also created a version of familiarity and the world of the things familiar. So even many people have seen them miss God in what is familiar. Now, you remember this portion of scripture. I want to I wanna talk about Jeremiah 29, 11. You caught it. You have it on your phones. You have it on your... Some of you have them as tattoos. Why do you put tattoos on your body? It's up to you. But, you know, some of you have them on your bed. You have them on your cars. You do all of these kinds of things. For I know... One, two, three, let's go. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of what? Peace and not of what? evil and to give you an expected end. Now, that portion of scripture is too familiar to you that right in there, quite a deep revelation has been hidden in there. And this is it. Follow the language. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And he says, those thoughts that I think towards you are of peace. They're not of evil. That means the true image of God, the true mind of God is to do man good and not evil. Now, if anybody has ever given you a vision contrary, then I want you to realign your mind back to truth. Every thought God has towards you is good. But what if I did this and what if I did that? Every thought that God has towards you is good. But Apostle, you don't know what I've done. Every thought that God has towards you is good. Even in that weakness, he wants to help you out. Yeah, he's not supporting your weakness. He's trying to take you out of that sin. It's a thought. Are you following what I'm saying? That is why even when we're dealing with fallen believers, okay, the Bible says if a man is overtaken by fall, let you who are spiritual, don't restore him in a spirit of criticism and judgment. He says restore him in a spirit of meekness considering yourself lest you be tempted. That you can be judged and tempted in the very weakness that you criticize a man over if you don't understand the spirit of God in restoring the fallen. God wills that no man should perish. But he says, but that they might all come to the knowledge of the truth. He wills that all men be saved. God doesn't want anybody to, even the fallen people. And I always warn you, believers, eh? especially when a man or woman is chosen by God. That's the difference between Saul and David. It's the difference between Saul and Samuel. It's the difference between Saul and Samson. Because Saul was people's choice. He was the choice of men. We want a king. Oh, no, no, no. God says it's, it's, that's, that's permissible. It's not perfect. And they said, no, we want a king like any other kingdom. So God says, okay, I will still use my principles on what is permissible. And this is the thing that has always confused me about God. Not really confused me, amazed me. That God will even apply principle in that which is permissible. And for some, they think that because he has a line principle to permissible will, they think that therefore God approves of that thing. Because permissible will too 
comes with blessing. It can come with blessing. You see? But there's a difference between what God says, I have allowed you to do this because you are, are lasting for it. And that's okay for you to do it because that's what you want. But if you had broken enough to me to tell you what I want, I would have given you that which is perfect. And some people settle for permissible. Some people are married in a permissible will. Hey, you see, you see, some of you say, you know, whatever the Lord has joined, let no man put asunder. No, it's only because you think that everything that goes before an altar has been joined by God. Don't think that because it has gone before an altar, God has joined it. No, 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 no. You cannot twist God. No, no, no. That's why I tell my young girls, don't get an unbeliever and tell me you're joined by God. No! God told you, do not be unequally yours. You understand what I'm saying? So, but you, you can go in the permissible and God can bless you because he loves you. He's not going to throw you away because you're crazy. And that's how merciful and gracious he is. So you have not lost it all because you made that one mistake. There are other ways God will work through to redeem you. But my point is, there is still a perfect will of God. The Lord appeared to me when I was a young man and told me, choose two ways. I can make a very successful businessman and through that, build the kingdom that way. But I have called you as a minister on the altar. It I mean that I, 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 I shouldn't do business. No, I'm, a, I'm still a businessman. But God told me that if I choose the way of business first, before ministry, he will bless me. But he told me, but that's not my perfect will for you. You see what I'm saying? And indeed, when I went into banking, I went up so fast. At one point, I was actually, I think, the youngest branch manager in the country. So, yes, I, I, I progressed very quickly. There was a blessing of God there. You see what I'm saying? But the perfect will was that I was supposed to be a teacher, a preacher of the gospel. You see? And so I had, I had the choice to say, no, let me just continue working. Yes, the blessing of God will follow me. I know many people who are so blessed in the permissive, and they think that that blessing presupposes that they are in the perfect. But let me tell you, those two wheels are different. They are different. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not going to get a, a married man and then lure him into marrying you and because you have been joined in church, therefore it is the will of Abaluganda. <laughs> God cannot be mocked. Do you understand what I'm saying? But there are people who have done it and they are okay, they are happy. But they, they could have been, you see. So I'm not here to judge you again, but I'm trying to tell you, maybe you made your errors in the past and I'm not here to look into your past. My point is, understand that there is a perfect will. Israel, actually, if you read Deuteronomy, you realize God had prophesied that he would raise a king one day for Israel. And God's revelation for that king was through David. David was a choice vessel for kingship, even before Israel asked for a king. But Israel came through their own personal permissible will, and then Saul was given with principle, and God blessed it. My principle is I must go to the uh, most predict, uh, the, the least expected family, the poorest tribe, the poorest house, because I love hiding in the familiar. That's just the way of God. And that's why I tell you, some of you, the fact that you were chosen by God, there must have been something so wrong with you. She, search yourself. Paul says, let, brethren, let us consider our callings. Not many of us were noble. Not many of us were wise. Not many of us were foolish. That is why Paul glories in his infirmity, because he looks and realizes, if I didn't have this weakness, God would have chosen. Oh! Do you understand what I'm saying? But hallelujah to God, who looks at our witnesses and says, that's exactly the reason why I want you. So, back to the story. So you see, when Saul fell, God did not restore Saul. Because it was not his choice. He didn't restore what he hasn't chosen. But when David fell, 
because it was a choice of God. God worked everywhere. In fact, David understood God to the instance. He got that revelation so deeply and said, even if I make my bed in hell, you will be there. You understand what I'm saying? They, he understood it. They understand it. Do you follow what I'm saying? So the, 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 the issue here is that many of us don't understand what it means for God to choose a person. David was restored because he was chosen of God. Samuel was restored because he was chosen of God. Samson was restored. He just made the wrong prayer. When they take him on the pillar, he says, let me die with the Philistines. That was answered prayer. <laughs> but God restored his strength. There is no man in scripture chosen by God that he would allow to die. He will never let his holy one to see corruption, nor his soul wrought in hell. God is zealous for the chosen. He is. You just need to know his way. So that's why you should be so slow to judge people. Peter, he told him, I know that you're going to fall. I've seen the devil sift you as wheat. But when you are restored, I've prayed that your faith will not fail you. But when you are restored or converted, you shall restore your brethren. He knows it doesn't matter how far Peter will fall. One day he will be converted and he must restore his brethren. Why? Because he was chosen as a foundation on which he was going to build a church. And this is a thing that many of you will never understand. That there is no man or woman chosen by God. And God did not see every failure they would do. Because he's Jehovah. He's omniscient. Omnipresent. He is the author of ages and time. He knew whatever this person was going to be. And he still refused to call you. And he chose him. He refused to <laughs> choose the other. And then he chose her. You see, so respect God in his calling. Some of us think we are wiser than God. That's why I don't, I don't want to sit around where people are judging ministers. Don't sit there. Don't. You, you find something to do. You know, the Bible says, blessed is a man who does not what? Who walks not in the what? In the counsel of the ungodly. And then after walking, they even stand in the conversation. In the way of sinners. And even after standing in the way of sinners, they even sit in the what? In the seat of the scornful. Translate for my American friends. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't sit in some conversations. Because you don't know where that woman is going with her God. Mama, if God chose her, she will stand. If God chose that brother, he will stand. Don't waste time with, with designing who was called, who wasn't called. Examine yourself, the Bible says whether you are in the faith. Did you just deal on your course and let God handle his own people? You remember when Absalom judges David, his father? This man, how could he kill but uh, Uriah and take over? How? A king? This is his son. And the Bible says, and the whole Israel who went with Absalom. And we never believed of a day where David will go through Israel and leave, flee because they are going to kill him. But again, God restored this man and put him back into his office because the Lord knows how to preserve his anointed. He does. He does. You just need to make sure it was not a familiar vision of a, it's a familiar spirit that came in a vision. But if it is God who appeared, he will preserve you. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, the thoughts God will always have towards you are of peace. And not of what? Evil. But now the line here next says, to give you an expected end. And this is the mystery. That every thought I have toward you, every plan I have toward you, which is of peace and not of evil, is only allowed to manifest and show itself if you have defined or aligned your expectation to my purpose concerning your life. My will and purpose or thoughts for you cannot work or apply themselves except if your expectation is aligned to my will. In other words, 
It doesn't matter how many thoughts God has toward you. If your expectation is flawed, you'll frustrate the grace of God that is supposed to operate on your life to fulfill his plans toward your life. The Bible says they that observe lying van vanities forsake their own mercies. It's important for you to have the right vision of divine thought. And that is why usually the word expectation and hope are what? Are used interchangeably. And I want you to look at life this way. That when the Bible says, I know the thoughts, the Hebrew word there for thoughts, machash shaba, machash shaba, the Hebrew word there for thoughts is likened to a weaving of fabric. That means every thought God has about you is as one who is weaving a fabric. He's weaving a cloth. Okay, if, you, if I want to make this coat and I start weaving and weaving it and putting one piece upon the other, every thought that God has towards you is like a construction of your destiny. And therefore, you must respect the process that builds you into what you must become. This coming Thursday, I'm going to preach about the mystery of grace and what it's like and what it... in, in, in and how it works in the power to become. Because some of you don't understand this, that it's possible to live in this world and not become what God has created or called you to be. Your full potential is not out. You see? It's not revealed. So this weaving is, is a design to show the world, to build without what you carry as identity within you. Are you following what I'm saying? And that is why when I was talking about the chosen, one thing that I need to emphasize here is that to know a man or woman which is chosen, there is a distinctive seed God has placed in the heart of the chosen. They know. Every man who carries that seed knows their way back to God. They know their way back to God. They know how to reconcile with God. They know. They know. They know how. You see what I'm saying? Now, when God is weaving your story out here and people are seeing whatever, allow that there's going to be a progressive journey. You're coming, you're becoming something. Yeah, so there, there are mistakes, there are errors, there are things that might not be perfected outside. But it begins with that seed which is inside you, your identity. It's very important. It's very, very important. Who are you? In fact, if you study the word education from the Latin word educare, it means to go within a man and then mold him without as he is inside. That's supposed to be the true pattern of education. Unfortunately, um, today's education, which is against the system of God in some instances, it goes without and then pumps your child with everything the world knows into them, and then they are examined against how much they have understood of how much has been given them, and then either they pass or fail. There's a, part, there's a parent, about now three parents, who all share a story and they're in this ministry. They, one of them came to me and told me, I have the stupidest boy in the, in the world. The boy is getting 20 or 15, 15, 20, 20. I told her, no, your boy is not stupid. When I look at him, I don't see that a boy is stupid. So I get this word of wisdom and I tell her, take this kid to this school. I gave an instruction. She gets the kid from one school, takes her to that school. And the very boy who was stupid in his class, since he was a child, now in his teenage age, for the first time he became first in class. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? What was the problem? The problem, I told her that your boy's brain studies differently. And this was a word of wisdom. God gave me wisdom to, this, to connect. And I realized that this boy's mind works differently from other men. I mean, some of you have read the stories of men like Churchill. Churchill was dyslexic. He couldn't even write letters right. He wasn't dumb. It was just how his brain was. I don't know whether it was Albert Einstein. The teachers told the mother, we, your boy cannot study. His brain can't catch anything. No, the boy was not in that dimension. Oh. 
So the woman goes into her son and tells her, you're not stupid, Albert. You're not stupid. You're not stupid. And look what the man gave us. E equal MC squared. Theory of relativity. Some of you even failed to cram it. You don't even know what M means. Yet you're first in your class. Are you following what I'm saying? So that is why the church should have a conversation on how to design education that goes inside our children to mold who they are. Such that education is to discover your child, not to impose on them an image and a character or nature of which they don't carry, no understand or can agree with. And so some children are in school, but with very disconnected worlds, because that's not who they are. You see, and some of you who live in Uganda, the colonialists, the British fellows, I forgive them, they designed systems because they knew you were going to be uh, a colony forever. And so they could not design anything from your education system that would become master. You were to be slave forever. You graduate as a clerk. You're taught. And, and, and I just realized some time ago that our education system is just being, tra they're trying to revise it now. Since the 50s, we're using the same education system that the colonialists gave us, and they were, we were to be servants or slaves. No wonder you're still looking for a job because your master left long ago. It began from your nursery rhymes, your classroom rhymes, ba, ba, black, black. Have you ever seen black sheep? No, but you sang it. Have you any woo? Yes, of course, you have to have it. So three bags full. One for my master, one for my den, and one for the little boy who brings down the head. Ba, ba, black. So one time I'm thinking and I'm like, hmm? I've never seen a black sheep. All them sheep I know are white. You understand? Imagine that, that nursery teacher who went to these children and told them, Simple ring, simple ring. My father is a lump head and we have similar, similar heads. Simple ring, simple ring. My father, lump head, similar, similar head. Oh yes! Oh yes! I think some of you have just discovered now that it wasn't simple ring. It was simple ring, simple ring, my father, lump head, similar, similar heads. <laughs> How can you plant a seed in the brain of a child that they can't count? Fetuli, embatento, te tu mani kubala. Are you following what I'm saying? Because they didn't expect you to become independent. That's why Nelson Mandela is arrested for 27 years, incarcerated on Robben Island. Because he's telling men that we're equal. Nah. You see what I'm saying? So, when we talk about education, I even worry, because some of our people, <laughs> it's actually brainwashing. They wash everything and then define a world that you don't understand. And then you find a graduate. You find a graduate, they have excelled in their master's degree, and then you give them a desk and they can't perform, not even one task. We've seen them. They speak so great English and you're like, oh my God, and they don't even have a work ethic. They don't even have a backbone. They can't even endure stress. Two, three things, I'm done. They throw their wig away and walk. I can't stand this bother. Because they don't know who they are. They quit in life. That's why you go to the UK, Europe. The, 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 the suicide rates are high. These kids are giving up life at a very young age because nobody defines who they are. The world does. 
That is why Christianity, when the gospel comes, why we teach what we teach, that you begin with your little boy at home and tell them you are great, you are wise. There is nothing in the world that you cannot do. You are more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens you. You are the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. Forward you go and upward only. Oh, you're going to change this world. You Oh, dream big. Believe in yourself. You must plant these words. But some of you, even from where you were born, the first word you had from you, you had from the supposed pure voice you should have listened to to define your destiny called you stupid. You were stupid. Bring your head here. And then they planted stupidity early. Now you ask yourself why as an adult this man cannot write a report. Because the seed was planted wrong. So the gospel is there to enter inside you. And bring out that treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellence of power might be of God. That is why I tell our ministers now. We must take the gospel to the next level. You cannot be a pastor who doesn't know how the world works. No, 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 no. You, you must know how the world works. Study quantum physics, understand chemistry, know how the NFTs work, understand how the stock exchange market functions. Why? Because God needs your opinion also on those things. But some of our pastors know as long as we are going into heaven. So we have Christians who are on the earth and they are not beneficial. But every night they are praying, every day, every day, every day they are praying. Am I against prayer? No, I'm not against prayer. I'm only saying there's a problem when you have a praying person who has no contribution to their nation. Nothing. But they're waiting for the second return. Mama, what if he tarries? <laughs> what if he tarries? We're looking for the next president. Who should be born again? And for you, bro, 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 bro. no! After bo, 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 bo. get into and start acting, study connect understand how things are we're looking for the next scientist they should come from here we're looking for the next information technology specialist they should come from here the next best doctors researchers they should come from here the next leaders of our nation they should come it's the only way we can be the heads and not the tail no we're speaking in tongues and funny people in the offices up there making decisions that are destroying our own people How did we enter this Karamoja thing? People are dying in Karamoja. And I was sharing with my family. A woman was found dead in her house. Dead in her house. And her baby was still suckling her breast. Do you understand? In this nation? In this nation? So who is representing these people? What is our education doing? 85% almost of our land in Uganda is arable. We can plant anything. In Uganda, there are places you can throw a seed and it grows. I was invited by the government of Israel uh, some time ago, and they were discussing on helping some of us, uh, using us to talk to our governments to bring better methods of farming. Because these boys in dry land are exporting food. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you call a government official and tell him, we want to improve our agriculture. And he says, but uh, those Israelites have money. And no, we don't need their money. We need their mind. Uh, uh, but you know, everything is money. No. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this fellow went to school too. He has pictures. In a graduation, what? Go. <laughs> but somebody never told him to love his people. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what did he learn? What did he learn? Are you following what I'm saying? How can the food basket, Uganda is able to feed more than 200 million people. How, can, how is it that as we are 48 million, some people are not eating food? Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and, and we think that it's okay because some of you are even still throwing away meat. You just say, ah, this, this chicken, ah. You, you, you see where I'm coming from? So God needs to help us. And, and, and now I'm, I'm praying for Christian leaders more than ever before. No, 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 no. 
Praise the Lord. Yes. Because it's only the revelation of Jesus Christ that can teach you to love fellow man as you would love yourself. We have a great work to do in this nation. I want to finish. I want to run, to, I want to run through this and, and, and finish. So as I was telling us, God is saying, I need to deal with your expectations. Sorry, I went sometimes. Pray for me. I'm also trying. I'm trying. <laughs> so sometimes the word hope and, and expectation are used interchangeably. But they're slightly different. What is hope? Hope is the expectation of good to come. It's the expectation of good to come. You understand what I'm saying? And so, so what is expectation? Expectation is the true vision of divine thought concerning your destiny. It's the true vision of divine thought concerning your destiny. To see with the eyes of God. You cannot see with the eyes of God and not carry expectation. Why? Because the plans are good. The plans are good. Do you know that hope by the Spirit is supposed to precede or precedes faith? 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now the Bible says, now these three abide. Faith, hope, and love, charity. But the greatest of these is what? Is charity. Because in, 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 uh, in the sacred language, Hebrew, usually they, they, the last things are emphasized more than the first. You see what I'm saying? It's just the nature of language. So when you have three elements of expression, the third one is, is greater than the second, and the second is greater than the first. You see what I'm saying? So in some instances in Scripture, not all, they put the, the greater ones last here. Love, the greatest, was mentioned as the... Meaning if we are to get that order right, it is love that leads us to hope, which is the expectation of good. And that expectation of good defines the foundation of our faith. Because if your faith is not on the expectation of good, it is perverted. And perverted faith is called unbelief. Some of you, some of you don't know how much faith you have. If you want to know how much faith you have, look at how much unbelief you have. Every time I've studied a man who is walking in unbelief, I have seen the equal measure of how much faith they can have if they choose to believe. And men who have understood this learn the way of faith so beautifully. Do you understand what I'm saying? You learn the way of faith so beautifully. Because look at an atheist. Do you know how much faith you need to believe that there is no God? Those guys have faith. Think about it. You look at lakes and trees and living life, you know, uh, flora and fauna, you see fish, you see things flying in the air, you see, you know, events changing, you look at how the human brain is working and you can say there is no, <laughs> that is too much faith. <laughs> and, and then they say that we have faith. No, those guys have faith. <laughs> Trust me, think about Darwin thinking that there was an explosion somewhere, a big bang, boom. And out of this little small matter, life came out. And then somehow things started. And then a, a what became a what? That's too much faith to believe. Eh? That you came out of some creature that no longer has shape today. That's faith, but it's perverted. You must understand. You must understand the concept of faith. That's how it works. So when you say, I don't believe in this, it's only because your faith is perverted. You see, when you understand how God works, in Rwanda, I gave an example in the first service, one of the ladies, I've received quite a number of cases of, of cancers, stage four, stage four, stage three, bad cancers. A lady, uh, recently there's a family that called me, there was a lady, they told her, oh, there's nothing, nothing. His cancer has moved, it has. And then this family put me on Zoom, on Zoom with her. And I will never forget, I am sharing the word. In the middle of the word, and I'm building faith. People are responding. And out of this woman's heart, the word she speaks out of the abundance of the heart. She, we didn't even expect it. She just burst out and said, Pastor, I am not ready to die. But by the boldness with which she spoke, I knew she was healed. 
I knew. And just a few weeks later, they could not trace cancer. You understand that? Because it's not about what the doctor has said. In this room, I have a lady. I don't know where she is. She, she, was also, she came to me a couple of weeks ago. They brought her here. Where is that lady? She had cancer. A couple of weeks ago. Where is that lady? She had cancer. I wish I can get her. This lady had... Uh, it was... Uh, is she here? Come, come. Come running. This lady... They brought her just some time ago. Come running, come running. They brought this lady some time ago and she had, do they call it nozzle something? From the throat all through, it had moved. Eh? Come, come quickly. Get to get one a mic. I want to show you how faith works. Come, come up. I want them to see the face. If you saw this woman, you'd weep. If you saw this woman here, you would weep. This woman here, you'd weep. It had eaten up the nose area all through down here. And then she goes to the doctor and they check and they tell her it's stage four terminal. She went home and they asked her at their home, what stage is it? What did you tell them? It's still at one. It's a small thing. I did tell them that it was stage four. Do you understand what I'm saying? She, she, she told them, no, no, it's small. Still in its infant stage. But only we knew the way she was looking the first time they brought her. Do you know that person you ask, how is she even going to go home? Ladies and gentlemen, there is no trace of cancer in this woman's body. No trace. The doctors have looked, there is no trace. I just wanted the world to see what God can do. God bless you. Let me tell you. She had the word and refused to believe the report of the doctors. She could have told them it is four. She told them no, it's one. It's very little. But we knew they had told us it had moved. Laid hands on her. And I told her, you have to get married. You must have children. You must live a full life. You cannot die now. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. With God, all things are possible. Just direct your unbelief to faith. Just, just, just switch it. Just switch it. Just switch it. And this is the mystery of expectation. To expect good. Just this. I tell people, you don't need to even expect to the level of God. You just need to have some sort of expectation. That man, Mark, come. Come, come, come. Come, come. I, I have testimonies. Thank God you've even come to so. This fellow, he had some funny disease. He went to the doctors. His father had died just that very day. He had died that very day, that very period. I looked at Mark. I went back home. I even wept. This man was to the bone. This man was going to die. And I told this man, <laughs> just enter the word and just run crazy. The man went into the word. Look at this man. <laughs> Babu, who did it? You, you speak. <laughs> Praise God, church. Um... I'm amazed of what God is doing in my life. 
That's, uh, I have nothing to say, but I thank God for my life. I thank God for my life. I met him when my dad had just passed away. He believed in me, he was a pastor, and uh, when he passed away, that's when I knew that things had messed up. So, I don't know what had happened to my life. Actually, when we went to the hospital with my wife, she, they tested me. They told me, I don't know, they term it in medical, but they told me I had a problem with my liver. And uh, I told the doctor, don't print out that report. You know, I don't need it. Actually, I told them I don't need it, but send it to my wife. Send it to my wife. And uh, I moved out of the hospital. I'm telling you, since then, I remember meeting Papa, and he told me, all is well. All is well. For those seeing me right now, this is not Mark they knew. Some of them weep because they knew I was dying the next day. When they buried my dad, they thought I was dying the next day. And uh, that's it, Papa. Praise God. I thank God for Praise you. God. Glory to God. Now, let, let, me, let me tell you why. Seba, you can have a seat. You, when you looked at Mark, you'd cry. He had lost every ounce of skin. It was just a skinny man like this walking. And any time, even he thought he was going to die. Do you understand? But that expectation of good. You know, sometimes you, you don't need, you don't need so much. You just need to believe that something good will come out. God says, even if it is as little, as a mustard seed, just expect good to come. You remember in the story of the man on the temple called Beautiful in Acts chapter 3? The Bible tells us there's a lamb man born from his mother's womb. He's carried daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful to get alms. People are giving him something to eat. And then he sees Peter and John coming to the temple. And then he asks them for alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on this man, tells him, look on us. Because it's important to define a certain vision when you're looking at the anointing. It's, the vision is powerful. I, I gave you an Some of you, I don't know whether you've seen it. You remember in the anniversary when there was this girl who was uh, crippled for a year, among the people who were healed. You remember the girl who was crippled for a year? I couldn't walk. There was a girl in Nairobi. She had not walked for 28 years. 28. So if you're 28 and below, you know what I mean. So when she sees this girl walking, she's so. She just got the canes and threw them away and said, how can I, how can I stay crippled? <laughs> Some of you saw the video. She'll, she'll come to Uganda soon to testify. She said, how can I stay crippled? The girl walked. Because it's just about changing the man's vision. You see, he's asking for alms. This guy says, no, no, look on us. Silver and gold have I known. You see, when it tells him, look on us. The Bible says, verses 5, and he gave heed unto them, listen to the word, expecting to receive something. This man was not expecting a miracle. He was just expecting to receive. That's why I tell you, sometimes your expectation might not match God's expectation for you. But the fact that you can even expect a little, it's enough to give you more than you expect. Somebody shout hallelujah! So, he just, maybe he was expecting money. But the fact that there was a little seed of expectation, Peter looked at this man and said, I think this guy can heal. 
And the Bible says, silver and gold have I not, but that which I have in the name of Jesus, I give to you. Get up and walk. And the Bible says, and Peter stretched up his hands and lifted this man and immediately the man walked. Was he expecting a miracle? No, but he was expecting something. Just live in the, in, just live in the realm of expecting something. You might not have the full vision of it, but at least expect something. Do you know there are people who don't expect to be healed? I have a church member who has fallen with full-blown diabetes. And you know what I did? I told her, go back tomorrow and the, the same doctor checks you. Go back tomorrow. And she went the next day and they couldn't trace even... <laughs> God, hmm? just expect good. My father once was checked and they said, diabetes, diabetes. They put a machine, what, diabetes? And then I went home, he says, don't give me sugar. I said, what's up? Diabetes. I told him, daddy, you don't have diabetes. But they checked me, I Gundi checked me, even Gundi checked me, even the other machine, even Dr. Gundi checked me. I told daddy, you don't have diabetes. It is. You don't. Amen. But don't give me sugar. <laughs> so I said, let me take this man to a doctor. I went with him. We sat. I said to the doctor, this man doesn't have diabetes, but they've deceived him that he has it. I knew... But I, I, I was expecting something good. And the doctor checks this man and says, No, 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 no. Apostle, this man is no more. There is no diabetes. He was to start medication. I told him, So why, why are you going to start if you don't have it? Up to them out of his stepping. No diabetes. Glory to God. Sometimes you have to refuse. <laughs> refuse. Somebody said hallelujah. Just refuse and say no. I believe to see the salvation of the Lord in the land of the expect something good to come. I don't care what you've had on your marriage. Begin by expecting something good. I don't care what they've told you about your education. Begin by expecting something good. I don't care what the doctor said on your body. Begin by expecting something good. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I have a fellow in this ministry. They go to the doctor and they told him that he has zero sperm count. Zero. Not little, zero. I just called his wife and I said, carry my child. She carried the child. I told her, put her down. It was done. <laughs> they conceived. You are joking. Glory to God. <laughs> they conceived. After doctors telling us that this man cannot have children, I just told her, carry my child. Put the child down. I remember the time I told my wife, this person, they are going to conceive. I was praying. I saw the vision very clear. Two, three months, ta. now she's carrying a baby. <laughs> tell your neighbor, it's not over. <laughs> hey, you're still fighting and you'll come out. I said you'll come out. Hey, don't, don't agree. Don't, 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 don't just agree. Don't, don't accept defeat early. Ah, 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 ah. Put on your, put on your suit, your fighting suit. And tell the devil we are going to the end. I told people the devil can fight hard, but he cannot fight long. He can get to a point and say, ah, ah. Somebody say we are more than conquerors. that something good will come. Just expect it. Look to God with expectation.
expectation. Glory to God. Look to God with expectation. There is nothing he cannot do. <laughs> There's nothing he cannot do. Don't be deceived by what the world thinks. Glory to God. And let me teach you one more secret before we close. Do you know that you can even go beyond expecting something good? And then you learn to position yourself in the spirit to carry the vision or if not create the vision of your expectation did you know that the psalmist says in psalms uh, 62 verses 5 he says my soul comma wait thou only upon god for my expectation is from him in niv it says my hope is from him some people read and translate that portion of scripture to mean that um i hope in him but if you study the hebrew it means he is the one who defines my expectation he is the one who defines my hope my expectation is from him that's what it literally means so this man is saying he was in trouble once and he was perplexed about an issue and then he started to seek God and as he was seeking God, God defines the image of what he should expect. It began from expecting something good and then it went to the level of getting a vision of that good to come. God, let me tell you, if you learn to seek God right, if, that's why, you see, let me give you an example. If you're in some sort of trouble and you need to seek God to come out of that trouble, begin firstly that you expect you'll come out. That's expecting good. But if you are bold enough to believe God, you can even go to the next level of faith and then seek his face to define the vision of how you'll come out. And if you're even of higher faith, God can push your spirit to the liberties of the wisdom of phronesis. Because Sophia, mother of wisdom, carries two wisdoms. Soonness is the critical faculty that warns you. It tells you the things to come so you should prepare or deal with them. Or phronesis, that if they come, I can determine how they go. Do you get it? But that's only expressed in the liberties of the spirit as a place of maturity. It's like it's demonstrating power. You see, I can pray and God what moves. But when you are positioned in a place where you 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 know or have understood how God works, you can even by His wisdom choose to demonstrate Him in a way that is not conventional. That I might not say, oh, God, move or what. I can do something. Even if I do like this, God can start moving. You understand what I'm saying? Now, you can tune your spirit to a place where, see what's happening. Just like this. You see what I'm saying? Have I prayed? No. I just... That is phronesis. The Spirit of God wants to work with you in a way that he simplifies your life of demonstrating power. Because God can trust you enough to give you a liberty to demonstrate the end of a thing. That is why Jesus, in some instances, instead of praying for a blind man, you can actually spit on the ground, create some form of spittle, uh, some, some clay out of spittle, and put it on a man's eyes and his heel. Because he carries the wisdom and grace to do that. And when you learn the, the mystery of demonstrating power, you will realize that you, you can do the many ways through which the liberty of God can express himself through you because you have understood how to define expectation. You see what I'm saying? Now that young lady weeping didn't know that at doing this, the spirit of God can what? Can move. She didn't know that. Maybe she, maybe she didn't expect that. She has never seen maybe somebody do that. That doesn't make me cult. 
you understand? I just know how. And you too can. Do you understand? If Peter can look at a man and give him what he has, what, what is that? But then what he has gets into a crippled man and a man walks. What do you think is inside you? What do you think is inside you? Do you think you're a normal person? No, you're not normal. You are not. You think you are, but you are not. The Bible says you're in this world, but you're not of this world. Now, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish very quickly. Now, if you, if you even mature from simply receiving the image, he can actually give you the liberty to define how an issue will end. That's the mystery of you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. A lady comes to me in COVID and her boss was persecuting her. And when she spoke to me, I sensed by the spirit she was actually being persecuted. She wasn't just rebellious. You know, there are also those ones who come, I'm persecuted. I tell her, no, you're the rebellious one. Go back and kneel before your boss and tell them to forgive you. But how? Go. No, this one wasn't rebellious. She was actually being what? Persecuted. And then she tells me, Apostle, pray for me. So in prayer, phronesis, that wisdom, it's, it's the faculty of wisdom that determines the end because of the liberty of the spirit operating. I told her, I don't just want to pray for that woman to stop. I'm going to ask God to switch positions. And I told her, I'm going to switch those positions by faith. A couple of months later, this lady is hired by the company, by the organization, an NGO, that funds their NGO. And when she's hired by the organization that funds their NGO, she is put in charge to oversee the NGO where she was working. That is God. So she came and told me, Apostle, <laughs> they have changed. Like you say, they have changed. Then I told her, uh -huh. I gave her instruction on how to teach the other one how to deal with your juniors. I will not tell you how because you have asked me many more questions. Praise the Lord. But we have power. Tell your neighbor, we have been given power by God. This is not for special men of God. It's for everyone who believes. So everyone who believes. So when you get to that level of liberty, you'll actually determine how the miracle happens. You will determine how things change because God has trusted you. He has consecrated your heart. In that realm, you cannot last. Eh? So that's not a realm where can no men go. Don't think that because I've told that, you're just going to say, you man, leave that woman and come and marry me. Fire! That's not a place of carnal people. No. We know that he heareth us if we ask according to his will. You must have the revelation of the mystery of his will. Eh, I forgive you. Let's get to our feet. Oh my God, I feel so much faith in this room. My, 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 my. I am feeling so much faith in this room. And I feel that a miracle is going to happen. I feel so much faith. I feel so charged. Glory to God. I'm going to give you only two minutes to speak to God. Speak to God. My, 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 my. Something is going to happen in these few seconds. That is going to change someone's life. Open your mouth and speak to God. Open your mouth and speak to God. And as we are praying, if you're there and you've never given your life to Jesus and you say today, Apostle, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Come right now and receive him as your Lord and Savior, wherever you are. And you say, today I want to be born again. I'm tired of living a life of deception. I'm tired of living a life of struggle and strife. I'm tired of, of, of suffering. I'm tired of this confusion. I'm tired of living carnally. I'm tired of this addiction. I'm tired of, of this. Come, come and receive Jesus. If you say, I want to be born again.
come right now, I also want to pray with you as we close service. As the rest of you pray. God, I look to you. I want me all the way. You give me vision. See things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. You give me wisdom. You know just what to do. just come we always have children from Chiseni we dress them up we feed them weekly we take some to school and reset all those we are able because of your giving look at how they're looking now many are looking so good and so we evangelize we reach out to the lost we bring them to salvation bring them to salvation and every Sunday we, see, we feed them. Some are up there. Wave. to see All of those ones, you see. They come every Sunday. They have a meal with us. We pour into them. So the reason why I put them there 
is because many of them can't speak English. So I usually prefer a pastor to make sure that when they are confessing Christ, they speak the language that they understand. And today, Michal Abu Kenya, you're the chosen vessel. Gendo ya tuzaba and the rest of you who are here, repeat these words after me. By the way, there is somebody, you're just near those speakers. They are, you need to receive Jesus today. And you have refused to come. Come. You're just near those speakers there. You're supposed to receive Jesus today. Come quickly. There he comes. You spirit of death. That's death. But it lives today in Jesus' name. Now, now you see, she had refused to come. Yet her deliverance was today. Repeat this as after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, put up your hands. Anoint these ones. Deliver these ones. Separate them Spirits of bondage, I rebuke you. Live and lose now. I release the fire of God to consume and burn all manner of strife and struggle. You spirit of strife and poverty, get out of that woman's life. Go! In Jesus' name. This young girl has a barren spirit. I know she's not yet level, to the level of marriage. But when she was going to get married, she was going to struggle having children. You spirit of barrenness. Get out of her! And she looks 12, I don't know. But she was going to struggle having children. Now those of you who have received Jesus, just give us two minutes and walk with these people and we will pray for you, we'll follow you up and help you understand what it means to be born again. In Jesus' name they are changed. It will not happen again. Everlasting Everlasting A miracle has just happened. How long has your leg been in pain? Three months. Can you get a mic and see what God has done here? What was wrong with your leg? At Speak. first, uh, it passed through my, my back. Then I got the medicine. After, it, it came into my leg. So it has been pain. Paining throughout for, for, three months. for three months. What do you feel when I laid hands on you? She has left. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory to God. That's your God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everlasting. Power of the Holy Ghost. Everlasting. Precious Lamb of God. Broadcast was born.
brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at fenero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Fenero, make manifest.